Our next speaker has had a very distinguished career in American higher education, recently took a year's leave of absence from her present job to serve as a commissioner on the Atomic Energy Commission, is now back in Cambridge at the work she has been doing for quite a while as president of Radcliffe, someone whom a good many of you know quite well. It's my pleasure to present Mrs. Mary Bunting. Friends, uh, I should like to use my few minutes here uh, this evening to give you a, a kind of progress report. Uh, on uh, my findings and thoughts in, in this field, uh, much as I might report on, on recent uh, experiments in the laboratory. Uh, when, uh, in doing this, I, I, I'd like to touch very quickly uh, on and remind a few of you of, of how my own thinking has developed here, but I'm particularly interested in uh, some new aspects uh, that have impressed me just this, this year. Uh, I'm particularly interested in the, the fact that the things I'd like to emphasize tonight, the things I'm most interested in, are really quite different from the points I would have emphasized if I'd spoken to you uh, a year ago. Uh, reminding you uh, quickly of, of uh, um, this development in my own <clears throat> thinking. Uh, I really grew up, uh, went to college, went on to graduate school, uh, believing that this whole problem had, had been licked uh, long ago. And, uh, and, and honestly, not very, very interested uh, uh, in it. I wasn't aware of any particular personal problems as I, as I went along. I, I might question uh, other women's taste in the way they chose to live their lives, but not their freedom um, uh, to make their decisions, and uh, uh, so forth. Uh, as, I'm, as I'm watching uh, the students I, I talk with this year, I'm suddenly beginning to wonder whether some of the freedom uh, uh, that women uh, earned through the 1940s and 50s uh, when they uh, said no uh, to continuing education, when they said, uh, uh, I want to stay home, whether this wasn't very important, a very important step in what I see now uh, emerging. Uh, I, I'm reminded of the way uh, children grow up, you know, and they go through that phase when they say yes to every question you ask them and then uh, and a few months later, they say no to every question you ask them, and then they seem to be free uh, to say yes or no. Uh, and I wonder whether something of the same process may not have had to happen uh, uh, culturally. I don't know anything about this. <clears throat> uh, my own interest in, in uh, the problem uh, uh, was aroused post Sputnik, uh, but with, uh, when we came to realize as we were, uh, some of us were thinking about, uh, you know, uh, more uh, uh, scientific brain power and wondering uh, uh, what was happening, happening to uh, identified brain power. Uh, when we discovered that of the, the, uh, the identified uh, uh, bright young people in, in high school, and we didn't worry so much at that time about the ones who didn't show up because they hadn't had a chance, but uh, in terms of the identified ones, you know, in the top 10% by ability tests, when we discovered that more than 95%, maybe 98, 99% of those who did not go on to college uh, were, were uh, females, that one startled me and aroused my interest uh, in, in this uh, whole problem. And the clue, uh, 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 as I looked on this, uh, came from the fact that the government tried to, to suppress uh, this statistic, that this was censored, really. And uh, the, uh, uh, this led me to think uh, that America 
really didn't believe it would make any importance in that difference. Uh, uh, that, that as long as all the bright young men were going on, you know, everything was okay. Uh, and uh, that there really, really was a, a climate, what I call a climate of unexpectation uh, as to what women would do with their talents and education. And that very likely uh, this was this was the key because the thing that worried me, you see, was what you know why why weren't these girls going on? Uh, there was the the uh, manpower problem, but more important uh, in my view was the fact that uh, that they were missing so much, and uh, and why why weren't they going on? And and so my hypothesis, and and these uh, it's a very crude hypothesis, uh, was that that this climate. Um, uh, you know, dissuaded them, that, that it uh, got in the way of their motivation, that it also got in the way of the motivation of educational institutions, uh, uh, and uh, uh, so that they didn't really try awfully hard to do anything about this. And I began to see that even the women's colleges were awfully interested in training them up to the bachelor's degree, but, but you know, not awfully concerned with what you needed to do beyond then that the women's colleges were the slowest about admitting a married woman or a part-time one, uh, and so forth, that they weren't awfully interested. Well, uh, this was a pretty useful hypothesis, and an awful lot of things seemed to fall into place, like the way people talk to little children, and, and uh, this business about the women's colleges, and lack of research on what you're doing about this whole half of the population, and uh, uh, some of the exceptions fell in line, too. And uh, uh, so I started, you know, trying to do little experiments, um, like uh, uh, getting them to, to uh, Douglas College to admit the, uh, the women part-time in the city who, who wanted to go on to get their degrees, and a number of other experiments, uh, one of the larger ones being the, the Radcliffe Institute, to try, to try to try, in that case, to really show, you know, do something to change the climate a little bit. Uh, to indicate that we really did value what those women who happened to get educated and happened to be motivated might want to do with it, you know, and maybe if Radcliffe valued it, someone else would, and uh, so forth. Well, so much for, for uh, background. Uh, now just a, a few minutes uh, on, on, on the rather dramatic change that I believe uh, is, is taking place uh, now. Uh, in the way young women uh, are planning their lives. I don't know whether I'm more impressed as I grow older with, with how hard it is to make changes or how easy. Uh, uh, you can argue either side uh, of this. I don't think it's the things that have particularly that have happened, uh, you know, at Radcliffe or Minnesota or, or uh, any other place uh, that has affected this change half so much. Uh, as uh, uh, civil rights, uh, Phillips Brooks House, uh, the, uh, uh, the look we've begun to take at some of the things uh, that need to be done uh, in our society. In any event, I think that, that today, uh, the young women uh, whom I'm talking with assume, as they have for a long time, uh, that, they, that they want to get married, that they want to have families, that they want to give considerable time to this, but I find now that they are absolutely assuming also uh, that there is some important job they want to do way on down the line and that it's going to take a lot of preparation to get ready for this. Uh, and and uh, whereas once it looked so far down the line that there was a little feeling of, of, of why bother, that now... Uh, there, it looks so far down the line that they have the feeling we've got plenty of time to really get ready. Uh, and, and this kind uh, of planning uh, is going on. Uh, let me give you just one example. I could give you any number from recent conversation. Uh, one of my early ones was, was uh, a girl who said, yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm heading for, for hospital management. Uh, I'm uh, concentrating in economics here now. Uh, I'm <clears throat> expecting to go to medical school. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll read sociology and things like that when the children are little. Maybe the books will be better by then. Um, the, um, uh, I'll, be, I'll be ready uh, eventually uh, to, to do a job in, in hospital management. 
Well, this is the kind of, of, of talking I, I'm beginning to hear all around, and I think it's quite different. I don't hear much worry about uh, whether the education they're getting in college is relevant to their later life. I think that's just gone out uh, uh, on the whole. And this isn't, I don't think this is a, just a Radcliffe phenomenon. I talked about this in Texas a couple of weeks ago, and, and uh, a, a, a lot of the girls came up to me afterward and they said, that's exactly what, what we think. We hadn't realized it, but uh, <laughs> that, that, that's exactly uh, the, the way, the way we, we feel. The, uh, uh, it's not an awfully competitive sort of thing uh, in a way, they're not talking hard about, you know, I'm going to be a lawyer or I'm going to be a doctor, but I'm going to work on hospital management, I'm going to work on urban development, uh, I'm going to get this training uh, on the way. Uh, very serious uh, interest in getting ready. As, as one girl said the other night when a group came in, uh, uh, one of them said, yeah, we're all going to fix something, Mrs. Bundy. And I said, for instance, and they went around the room and they knew what they were going to fix. Uh, there's also the feeling that some of them mentioned that, that women have some very special advantages. As one of them said, uh, uh, the pattern of a woman's life, you know, this lingo, uh, uh, may be a handicap in, in, in the rat race uh, for position, but for what I want to do, it might be a, a distinct advantage. Or uh, as another one who's planning to go into uh, 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 surgery, hospital surgery, uh, said, you know, um, um, a woman doesn't need to worry that much about money. Uh, either, either I get married and I won't need too much to, to earn too much myself, or I won't get married and I don't need to earn too much. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a kind of uh, serenity about this. Well, um, the, the, the real point I'd like to make, and I'm trying to make this wherever I can, uh, to the people who may uh, 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 ought to be getting ready, um, is it that we've got a great many young women in America now who are motivated uh, to go on, uh, that the bottleneck now is going to be at the graduate and professional level. Uh, and, and that the real question now is about the motivation uh, of our graduate and professional schools. Uh, there are going to be two things needed, because these young women uh, uh, are, are not going to postpone marriage or children, perhaps, uh, indefinitely to get this long education that they want. Uh, there are going to be two things needed, and one is the flexibility uh, that, was, that was mentioned. Uh, they're going to need to, some of them to, to, to break uh, uh, for a while or to take it part-time for a while and so forth. The other thing that they're going to need is money. Uh, I think there's no question uh, about this. One of the studies we're uh, starting now at the Radcliffe Institute uh, is a study of the educational background and aspirations of the wives of graduate students in the Boston area. There are thousands of them. And I think to get this story and, uh, uh, and, and, and see this picture, here are these thousands tied into our university and fenced out. Uh, in so many cases. And uh, right at the moment when geographically they, uh, and in terms of time they could be going on, so many are, are kept out. And I suspect that uh, one of the big reasons will turn out to be financial. Uh, so that uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's going to be a new pressure on this whole thing uh, resulting from the point of view uh, of these young women, oh, I think a tenth of them from Radcliffe this year at least are, are, are planning to go to medical school, more than a tenth are planning to go to, to law school, and so forth and so on. And uh, uh, the, the, uh, I think that, that our graduate and professional schools now have really got to wake up uh, to a, a different uh, uh, kind of challenge and that it's going to be very interesting to watch it. Thank you. The Harvard Law School quinquennial contains the names of all Harvard Law School graduates with the LLB, the LLM, 
the SJD, all persons who flunked out of Harvard Law School, all persons who attended Harvard Law School and didn't flunk out of the school, didn't get any degrees, does not have the name of Miss Pauli Murray. So I think after she finishes telling you of her experience, you will agree with me it probably should be there. But she'll tell you about that. She is a lawyer. She has just recently been a senior tutor at Yale Law School after a uh, law work at Howard and at Berkeley and at Yale. She has been a practitioner, a government lawyer. I don't have any doubt that you are going to, going to enjoy listening to her as I have for just a short time before the session began. Miss Pauli Murray. Friends, uh, I'm glad to be here. It's true that I'm 22 years late. It is also true that I would have paid any money to be here tonight. Uh, and thereby hangs a tale. Most of us have been very concerned in recent years about dropouts. But nobody seems to have been concerned about a drop-in. Um, your president tonight looked over the biographical sketches and he said, uh, gee, you certainly have degrees from coast to coast. And I didn't answer him. I will answer him now. It was not necessary for me to go to coast to coast. I could have settled it all at Harvard two years ago, uh, two in 22 years ago in two years. Uh, Harvard inadvertently granted me two degrees, the Bachelor of Feminism in 1944 and the Masters of Feminism in 1946. And I am here tonight to take my oral examination uh, in the doctorate of feminism, but I am not sure that I see my inquisitors. In 1944, I finished Howard Law School, top of my class. Now, uh, don't get excited. As you know, top of your class simply means that it's good on paper and you have a better chance of getting a job. And it wasn't difficult to do it in 1944 because the Army had all the, op the competition and the opposition. But nevertheless, the top man in my class wore skirts. Uh, moreover, won a Rosenwald Fellowship, which specified for graduate work at Harvard. Uh, all the men in my class and the professors in the school, most of whom were Harvard graduates, uh, held degrees and graduate degrees from Harvard, uh, laughed in derision. I have never been known to lay down on a dare, so I forthwith applied to Harvard. And we went through the regular procedure of getting the undergraduate transcript. They asked for a picture. So I sent them one of my little pictures, and I wrote to Hunter College and said, send them up a manuscript. Well, there was a gentleman by the name of Mr. T.R. Powell. I think he is dead now, and I guess he is it was before your time. Mr. T.R. Powell was the chairman of the graduate committee. He wrote back and said, Dear Miss Murray, the salutation on your undergraduate transcript, at that time Hunter College was all women, and your picture indicate that you are not of the sex entitled to be admitted into Harvard. Uh, I have an excellent memory that is practically photogenic. Uh, well, it is said that a lawyer 
who represents himself as a fool for a client. I was a brash young law school graduate and I was my first client. So I promptly appealed to the Board of Overseers and indicated that I wished to go to Harvard Law School. Uh, and meanwhile, the president, Mr. Roosevelt, in the house, White House, was a distinguished alumnus or alumni of, of Harvard. And in those days, when we didn't like anything, we always wrote the president, so I wrote the president. But I tried to beat the system, so I also wrote Mrs. Roosevelt and sent her a copy. <laughs> and knowing that Mrs. Roosevelt was a real feminist at heart, I said, someday when you have a chance, will you slip this to the president? I didn't trust the male side of the ladder, you <laughs> said. And I thought my letter would get lost in, uh, you know, in Secretary 16's uh, pigeonhole. Well, sure enough, Mrs. Roosevelt did pass the letter on to Mr. Roosevelt, and he got a great kick out of it. Because I said, you know, Mr. Roosevelt, you're a distinguished alumnus of this uh, school, and you know that this is where people go and get the prestige degrees, and they become judges, and they become presidents, and whatnot. Uh, and women who are lawyers want the same opportunity. And uh, Mr. Roosevelt, FDR senior, was in a sense a feminist. He was never threatened by women. He, I think, appointed the first uh, cabinet member, uh, woman cabinet member, Secretary Perkins. So he wrote a very genial and amusing letter to President Conant and said, there's a young woman who wants to get into Harvard. And uh, President Conant, Conant must have looked up, up the record. And then he got very, very excited because he thought, oh my, they'll think that we are discriminating on the basis of race and we can't have Harvard's uh, reputation uh, impeached like that. <laughs> and so President Conant hurriedly wrote back to President uh, 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 Roosevelt and said, why, of course, we don't discriminate on the basis of race. Why, of course, Miss Murray can come to Radcliffe, and I am having my secretary send all the Radcliffe catalogs. The, the only thing, Radcliffe didn't give a master's degree in law. At which point, the Board of Overseers, or the Board of Governors, whatever the governing body of Harvard is, uh, met. And they decided they had nothing to decide upon because they had received no recommendation from the faculty. You can see that I was just out of law school and had not anticipated that move. Uh, they forthwith uh, informed me that they had made no decision because there was no motion or recommendation before them. I then reapplied to the faculty, having been a good law student, and I said, will you please ask the faculty to recommend to the Board of Governors that I be admitted to Harvard Law School? Meanwhile, all of the members of the Board of Governors who uh, I knew personally, one of uh, Lloyd K. Garrison, who was one of the members at that time, said, Polly, you haven't got a chance. Harvard has been that way 3,300 years, and it isn't likely ever to change. Uh, I, however, didn't know that. I was quite ignorant of tradition and, and how important tradition is. The faculty met again, but also anticipating that they were going to reject me. The only other school in the country that had a full-time faculty of the masters in those days, and in those days you would go to a university because it had certain professors. Uh, the only other law school in the country was the university of California, which had all of the sort of the almost retiring uh, uh, products of Harvard University. So <laughs> that's where I wound up on the other coast. When I arrived to register at the University of California, they said, oh, you're that girl who split the Harvard faculty seven to seven on your application to enter. Um, I had only wished there had been an eighth one and he was on my side because this would have saved me 3,000 miles in two years, but nevertheless, there it was. Um, the graduate degree was gotten at California. I returned east 
And it was then I learned that Harvard had taken a giant step. They had uh, appointed Soya Menshnikov, first woman faculty member. I thought, oh, this is wonderful. It's a chance for us students. So I forthwith reapplied. <laughs> Dean Griswold in those days was chairman of the graduate committee. And Dean Griswold wrote back in very solemn tones. <laughs> and he said, our full-time faculty has not yet returned uh, from uh, their war assignments. Uh, and we have returning veterans. And we cannot consider the question of women until we have dealt with the question of returning veterans. Three years later, I read in the newspaper that Harvard Law School had voted to admit women. But by this time, all my scholarship funds were gone, and it wasn't possible for me to go to graduate school. So this is how I got the Bachelor of Feminism degree. Uh, it should be clear by now that from the three speakers in the platform, uh, the word women as a stereotype should be uh, dispensed with. I seriously doubt whether there are three individuals who could approach this problem from more diverse points of view than the three individuals that you have here. Let me uh, start uh, my remarks, and I want to be very careful because I see we're running uh, quite late, and so I will be brief and you can get at me in the discussion. I want to throw out for your consideration uh, some thoughts that were advanced last year at a panel discussion at the University of California Medical Center called the Biologic Avalanche challenge to women. And this had to do with the population explosion that we are facing worldwide as well as the United States. And what did this mean in terms of its challenge to women? What role would women play either in uh, preventing this avalanche or slowing it down? What did it mean in terms of world problems, social, political, economic, and otherwise? One of the panelists uh, was Dr. Mira Komarovsky, head of the sociology department at um, Barnett. She made what I thought was a very perceptive analysis. She pointed out that a hundred years ago, men in America, and I must say at this point, white men, because Negro men hardly figured into the picture, uh, had exclusive privileges by and large, for education, the exclusive right to vote and the political power. And therefore, it was very logical and very natural that they should excel in all of the significant areas of public life and private industry and enterprise. That a hundred years later, we've been faced with a technological revolution and a human rights revolution. And unless you consider these rumblings from the feminine side of the nation in the context of the human rights revolution, of which the Negro Revolution is a very noisy uh, and more articulate part at this moment, unless you see this in a context of world revolution, you will continue to make jokes about it and to laugh and to talk about women. But it is very, very serious business, and let us not kid ourselves. Dr. Uh, Komarovsky pointed out that in this era of exclusive power and privilege and right to education, she suspected that men had equated supremacy and superior status with masculinity. And they had confused the two concepts. That a hundred years later, with a technological revolution 
and with the world revolution in human rights. This status, privilege, and power was being challenged. And having identified it with masculinity, the challenge to the privilege and the power seemed in fact to be a challenge to masculinity and that in this lies much of the confusion about women's rights, individuality, and whatnot. Uh, this analysis deeply impressed me. I throw it out to you for what it is worth. I want to talk a little bit about women's rights as citizens. And I want you again to keep it into this larger context. Forty years ago, women won the vote. Forty-six years, I guess, ago, won the vote. And they thought that they were citizens. They thought they had full political rights. Here in the great liberal state of Massachusetts, the cradle of liberty and abolitionism, Crispus Attucks, the Boston Common, Paul Revere, a woman was arrested on a minor uh, criminal charge and tried and convicted by an all-male jury. And she immediately uh, appealed the conviction on the ground that she had not been charged, uh, uh, convicted, or tried before a jury of her peers, i.e. a jury on which women were represented, this obviously was a violation of the 14th Amendment. She had all of the precedent she needed. She had a whole line of Negro cases, which had shown that where Negroes are systematically excluded from juries, this is a violation of their rights under the Equal Protection. And the majestic Supreme Judicial Court of Massachusetts ruled that even though the 19th Amendment was now passed, and even though the qualifications for jurors under the Massachusetts law said all persons who are qualified electors shall be jurors, it was not a violation of the 14th Amendment for women still to be excluded from jury service in the state of Massachusetts. Now let me take you to the ultimate and logical result of that ruling. Uh, the Supreme Court ducked the issue. It refused certification of the case and did not review it. This then appeared to remain the law of the land. And the great and doughty warriors of woman suffrage who had fought and gone to jail and uh, carried on demonstrations, not unlike the demonstrations we have witnessed in the last three years, felt that they had been... Uh, they had been deemed by the court not to be persons within the meaning of the Constitution of the United States, that there was a constitutional gap and that the only way that women could be recognized as full citizens was to have an Equal Rights Amendment. And they fought for the next 40 years to get this Equal Rights Amendment. And while they were fighting, the states did various things with jury laws. Some admitted women as jurors. Some gave women blanket exemptions. Uh, some made women go down to the courthouse and register their desire to serve as jurors before they would be put on the jury list. And three states, Alabama, M Mississippi, and South Carolina, by statute excluded women altogether. It is not surprising that these were three southern states in which we have had many of our problems in race relations. It is no historical accident that of the 10 states in the country which refused to ratify the 19th Amendment, the Equal Suffrage Amendment, only one of them, Delaware, was above the Mason and Dixon line. The other were the uh, uh, nine states were the nine, uh, nine of the former slaveholding states. And if you will check your annotated constitution, Corwin's edition, 1952, you will find that seven of those nine actually voted to reject the Equal Suffrage Amendment. In 1955 to 1965, there have been 89 race-related deaths by violence 
growing out of the civil rights revolution and crisis in the South. Of those 89 uh, summarized by the Southern Regional Council, so far as we have been able to determine, there have been only six convictions. The two acquittals, which probably sent us all into shock last midsummer, uh, were the acquittal of the accused slayer of Mrs. Uh, Viola Lee Uzo, followed immediately by the acquittal of the accused slayer of the young Episcopal seminarian from New Hampshire, both either acquitted or by a hung jury by all white, all male jurors. And we found from the Department of Justice experience that where there had been women on those southern juries, the Department of Justice had increased its chances of getting a conscientious and impartial trial. So let no one say that that case that we just won in Alabama, and I was one of the five lawyers on the brief, Judge Dorothy Kenyon was the second, and we were the ones who wrote the sex discrimination argument, and the court came right down the line actually using our language. Uh, I would say that after so many losses and so many failures and so many defeats in a lifetime, this was my sweetest victory today. Our concern was not nearly so much the rights of women, although those by themselves would have been sufficient, and we would not have had to apologize for them. But we are trying to find an alternative to the turmoil and the anarchy in the South. And if we are to have law and order in these states, particularly in South Carolina and particularly in Mississippi and Alabama and in perhaps a lesser degree in Louisiana, we must have an impartial jury system where Negro civil rights workers and white civil rights workers feel that they will get justice if they themselves are defendants, and where people will feel that if they are, by any horrible chance, murdered or beaten or their civil rights are taken from them, that the Department of Justice can go into those courts and punish the wrongdoers. And we immediately saw that not only were all the Negro males excluded from these juries, but all women. And so in Lowndes County, where these two murders took place, and where you got these acquittals by all white, all male juries, when you analyze the population, the adult population between 21 and 65, you found that 84% of the adult population potentially available for jury service were completely excluded, either by administrative practice, i.e. the Negro males, or by statute, uh, all females, white and black, leaving 16% only of the adult population of jury age available for jury duty, and this meant 738 names of white males. Of those 738, only 630 appeared on the jury list, and of those 630, 221 accounted for 66 percent of all the persons called for jury duty. Some of these 221 appeared five and six times, and some even as many as 15 and 16 times, and therefore you had the most unrepresentative type of jury that it is possible to find in a uh, county, a petty jury system, in the United States. And those of you who have studied constitutional law know this is in direct contradiction to the modern trend, which is toward a representative jury as a cross-section of the community, uh, the public interest that we have in having such a jury in order to have impartial trials. Uh, it is obvious that with me, I have had no choice but to fight for women's rights and to fight for Negroes' rights, 
And it will very soon be that I will have no choice but to fight for the rights of the aged. I am rapidly qualified. <laughs> I am also practically congenitally left-handed, so I'm always to the left in every situation, a little bit askew. And so I had nothing to lose uh, but to want to be an individual. And this is my third and final uh, uh, observation. Nature does not ask us where she distributes brains, intellect, talent, drive. She simply scatters these with the recombination of the genes. Uh, in some ways, I might have been disadvantaged to have been born a Negro in white America, a woman in a man's profession, left-handed in a right-handed world. <laughs> and I might throw in even an orphan at an early age. But there were, certain this, there were certain advantages in this status, which I didn't see then, but I see in retrospect. Negroes, as you know, are out of the mainstream of America. And being out of the mainstream, I didn't know there was any such thing as a woman's place. I was out there having a gay old time uh, with complete freedom of thought. My parents were dead. I lived with my grandparents. They were older people. They didn't have time to keep up with what a youngster was doing. And so I had none of the restrictions intellectually that many children are forced into today. I therefore came to sex discrimination much later than I came to race discrimination. And having fought the battle of race discrimination, I began to see how integrally these two discriminations were. Since I could not split myself, and since I had to be a unified human being, I decided that it was not I that was wrong, but the society that was wrong. And that any time a society penalizes an individual because of a biological attribute, whether it be race per se, or whether it be sex per se, that society is going to be challenged. Now, I'm not going to exhort or have any exhortations uh, about what women should do and what the men should let us do. Uh, you note that I come out of a struggle of a minority which has now so determined, it says, either America is going to let us in or we will keep America on its head for the rest of our lives. And this minority has demonstrated its capacity to do it. As a woman, in terms of the legal rights of women as citizens, who have both a right and a responsibility to share the levers of power of this country, I am not going to exhort the men to let us in. And now I speak to the budding members of my profession, the women who are studying law. The Negroes set the stage for a revolution by digging into the law books, burning the midnight hours, coming up with persuasive legal documentation and argument, the sheer logic of which forced a Supreme Court continually to retread its earlier uh, movement. This was not done entirely by Negroes alone. The whole world economic conditions were, and social conditions and social revolutions were plain. But basically these lawyers in their lonely law offices many hours at night were fighting the battle of the law books. And on sheer logic by itself persuaded those judges to respect their point of view. On February 7, 1966, when a three-district federal court came down unequivocally and said that the 14th Amendment applies to prejudicial disparities among all citizens, including women, I did not need a Harvard Law degree. Thank you.
they like it. Huh? I said that they like it. <laughs> The hour is late, and we want to give you an opportunity to ask questions. I think in order to um, take care of those who want to get home at a reasonable hour, I will simply be arbitrary and limit the question period to not more than 15 minutes under any circumstances. In other words, not later than 10.20. And, uh, of course, if uh, your questions uh, don't uh, come at all, or if you just sort of whimper out before 1020, then we'll know where you stand on the issue. <laughs> if there are any people who want to stay after 1020 and ask questions informally, I have no doubt they will be welcome. And so, my first point is, who would like to start the questioning. I should add that anyone who wishes to ask a question is requested to come to this microphone at the foot of the hall in order that his question may be heard on the tape that's being made of this whole program. He should also state his name and indicate to whom he is addressing his question. Notice my pronouns. <laughs> Fine. My name is Mark Finley. I just wondered if there isn't some subtle discrimination going on here right now. I noticed in the program there's a Nancy Sheckman on the uh, Harvard Law School forum. You haven't indicated to whom you're addressing the question. Uh, well, I'm just stating the question first there. Would you, would you tell us to whom you are addressing oh, the question? Samuel Doctor. Hmm? Samuel Doctor. All right. But uh, Nancy Sheckman is listed here and she has no part in the proceedings. I'd just like to see it. You see here? Uh, may you? I exercise simply the moderator's prerogative and ask Ms. Ms. Sheckman to please stand up. She arranged the entire program, as I understand, and had a great deal to do with it. Oh. Now, may we have a question? Anybody who wants to follow the, the questioner who is speaking is asked to come forward and indicate by just standing there that they want to ask the next question. Go ahead. Andrew Newman to Mr. Dunn. Um, you all seem to agree that there's a problem, and Ms. Dunton says that uh, the bottleneck is in higher education, and Ms. Murray says that the problem is in law, and I wonder what you want to do about it. I've heard nothing constructive from your point of view. Uh, you say that women do things which men do not take seriously, and you mentioned homemaking and volunteer work, being secretaries, etc. And I wonder, should women start doing different things, or should we start taking seriously what they're doing now? May I answer my part in one word and get, uh, get it over with? I, I don't know whether uh, Mr. Sudan wants to answer first. I was well, going to give you each a chance. Just, just one word. I have to call the tune on the question, you don't do anything constructive. I have been calling for a sharing of power from the presidency of the United States down to the sheriff. Now, this may be destructive because it will destroy privilege, but in my book, it's constructive. Well, I, you see, homemaking 
isn't ruled out uh, by what I say. It's, the fact of uh, life is that women in America and with the lifespan they have today simply cannot, for the most part, uh, uh, use all their abilities or all their years productively only in homemaking. So merely to ask that, uh, and I don't agree with Mrs. Bunning that the problem is all solved. I see declining numbers of women in, in, in all the, uh, still, in all the professions and in all of the uh, professions that are uh, going to exist in the, in the future world with when the secretaries, for instance, are going to be replaced and the bookkeepers by, uh, and the bank tellers by automation. Uh, most of the jobs women now ha hold outside the home will be automated out of existence. There is no way for women to use their lives and years productively within the homes, uh, uh, with the home, un unless they begin to have, uh, say, 10 and 12 child families, and even then uh, they are going to have half their lives after their childbearing years are over. So they must be able to get the kind of higher education that Mrs. Benning is talking about, which uh, means very much now in these years professional education, although there will be new professions and occupations e emerging. Uh, I think to take more seriously what women now do well, there's been a whole stream of propaganda for 20 years trying to say occupation housewife, we should make it a sacred thing. It, it requires more ability than to be an atomic scientist, you know, and uh, uh, combination chauffeur, gardener, cook, and all the rest. True, true, you know, we all do these things, women who uh, have children in homes, whether we're also college presidents or, or, or whether we do, do nothing beyond uh, the dishwashing and the PTA. But I submit that since 50% of the women in America are by definition above average, you know, let's, uh, let's uh, at least, uh, since, and this is probably the, the proportion that intimately concerns the people here, at least let's use these abilities in the most pos productive possible way in society. And prejudices have to be erased to do this. Images have to be created, and new patterns in society have to be instituted, whether they're nursery schools and, and different ideals, for instance, of childhood, which suppose that the mother's life is, is, is as important as a child, that the mother's time is not to be spent primarily in soaping with the child. The child could ride the bicycle himself, you know, things like that. Uh, to, to part-time patterns in, in, in graduate school and uh, to the, uh, to perhaps, I, I disagree that we can't counteract this early marriage thing. I certainly think we can counteract too, uh, too early motherhood. In, in India, child marriage is seen as, as the evil it is for the deterrent of the woman's growth. It is equally an e evil for a young rapturous girl to take so, uh, with little seriousness her education to, to think that she shouldn't plan in terms of her own future. She can uh, uh, put the boy through law school and maybe take up urban development some years later. I've seen those girls some years later. They're very worthy citizens. But the city of Washington is full of ones who would love to do something in urban development, but they cannot meet the professional qualifications to get hired by any of the agencies to deal with urban development, unless they have rich husbands. They're not very likely to get the professional education at 45 that they didn't get at 25. Let's see, who was the next person? I'm Kay Ryan. I'm at the Harvard Law School. I address my question to Mrs. Bunting. It wasn't exactly clear to me uh, what you meant by saying that the graduate and professional schools would have to take a different approach. I'm sure you have rather concrete ideas, and I'd like to have the benefit of them if you would like to expound on them a bit. Uh, thank you. Uh, just quickly, uh, and first may I say that uh, uh, I don't think the problems are all solved, of course. Uh, I just was trying to point out tonight some, some interesting changes that I think are going on, uh, on the, uh, in the way uh, young women are looking ahead. And although uh, uh, I think there, there uh, is a real shift uh, certainly among uh, Radcliffe students in terms of 
of the age at which they get married. Uh, uh, and uh, I don't think that they are planning uh, to postpone this beyond the time that they would, let's say, necessarily uh, finish uh, an internship uh, if they go on to medical school. Uh, I think that uh, the kind of plan they're making uh, is, is one uh, of, of finishing college and then somewhere along uh, in the next uh, period uh, they, they expect to, to get married. And instead of, 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 uh, of having a big gap later, what they'd like to do is continue their education through uh, uh, along with their family responsibilities. And that this is going to take a new flexibility on the part of our professional schools and graduate education uh, and uh, a willingness to value this kind of preparation uh, so that they will be uh, ready later, a willingness uh, to help them financially, even though they're working part-time. Uh, these two things are going to be uh, uh, essential uh, for, for this new pattern to develop. And uh, it's this that I have in mind particularly. There seems to be a trend in the pattern of development, and that is that most of you sort of address yourself to the question of women, their attitude towards their role. And this is bumping to a certain extent as to the new interest of women, which may perhaps become the legal possibility. I wonder what you're feeling, what you're feeling is about changing men's attitudes, which we haven't gone into in any great detail, and whether that is in, in some way necessary in your overall goal. Your name, please. Oh, I'm sorry. Peter Kubel from the law school. Well, uh, I, I haven't uh, ever thought there was any uh, great significance uh, to, to uh, the ideas of, of men uh, about these problems or of women uh, about these problems as such. Uh, it has seemed to me that, that, that uh, uh, as I first uh, got interested in this, that there was, there was a whole climate. Uh, and that it affected uh, most men and, and most women, and that there were exceptions on both sides, and that, that this uh, thing uh, better be looked at that way, rather than, uh, than talking about men's point of view or, or women's point of view. Um, I thought I suggested very clearly how to change people's attitudes. There is nothing so educated than a successful challenge to power. This we all know. We've seen it happen in the Civil Rights Revolution. I was one of the student sit in the 1940s, but all they did to us was just arrest us, carry us off to jail. Nobody knew about it because we had no power. We were a handful, 10 or 12. So when 50,000 Negroes began marching in the streets, Washington heard about it. When 240,000 citizens came to Washington on August 23rd, 1963, we got a Civil Rights Act so that um, I would educate the male brethren um, by beating them at their own game, uh, in part. But I would do more than that. I would try to appeal to their intellect. Um, in my odd moments, in my odd moments when I have nothing to do, else to do, I reflect and brood over an American society in which the average life expectancy of women in the United States is six to seven years longer than men. And this is a very sad and drab process, prospect of a society of aging, widowed, lonely women. And I say to myself, very seriously, without any jokes about who's the weaker sex or who's the stronger sex, what is happening in our society that men are being killed off six or seven years uh, younger than the women, leaving this tragic situation of older women aging without men? I happen to believe in a coeducational society. Uh, and, and so for me, this is a tragedy. And I say to myself that America is a competitive society and that, and Harvard, heavens knows, uh, 
is sort of par excellence of the symbol of competitiveness for prestige and power. But I'm wondering if instead of taking guns and shooting ourselves down, if we are not killing ourselves off by having overemphasized competitiveness, getting ahead, organization man, reaching the top, etc. The women, many of them, in their submerged position have not been exposed to this. And while I'm no scientist and cannot say, it just seems to me ordinary common sense that part of what is back of heart attacks and, and uh, uh, strokes and the kinds of diseases that are taking men away from here sooner than they should be going indicates and is symptomatic of some of the pressures of the kind of competitive society in which one group by and large shares or, or maintains the power exclusively. Now, I would be willing to trade the life expectancy of women for a sharing of power that would mean human beings generally, all things considered, would be moving off the scene at relatively the same time. And I say this in all seriousness. I think it is a serious problem. It is now 10.20. I think that last point of Miss Murray's is a point on which all persons of goodwill and even a good many of bad will could agree. I think what you've heard is a rather remarkable demonstration of the fact that there is genuine concern about this problem and intense concern, at least on the part of a small number. From them, I am certain more will be heard in the future. I have no doubt of that. But at the moment, I don't get the sense that they are really very much agreed with respect to the precise character of the problem or what should be done about it in the sense of still having some doubts among themselves as to where the emphasis should be. I'm afraid that so long as women remain a house divided, the men, the men will continue to say, dare we not discriminate? That is not something that leaves me very happy. Good night.